You're watching Business Incorporated live on Channel's television. Coming up on the program. Libya set to restart oil exports from two key western ports. Bad weather constraints. And Kenya Port Authority acquires a $28.9 million tugboat cranes for its Mombasa port. Plus, African Import Expert Bank and the state-run National Bank of Egypt signed MOU to promote trade and investment flows into Egypt. Welcome to the program. I'm Ladi Williams. I'll kick off uh, the midweek session with intraday numbers from major equities on the African continent. Uh, key equities tracked uh, were trading in positive territory with Nigeria and South Africa's uh, main index surged over 1% at intraday uh, similarly, EGX, Egypt's uh, EGX30 uh, was also trailing in green territory at intraday up 0.28%. Meanwhile, Kenya's exchange closed Tuesday's session on a negative note uh, down by 0.31%. And over to the Middle East, uh, where sentiments were mostly positive at intraday. The Abu Dhabi index was slightly up 0.09%, uh, while Dubai's index uh, traded lower at 0.37 percent. Elsewhere in the region, Saudi Arabia and the Qatari indexes were soaring at intraday up 0.53 and 0.92 percent each. And in Germany, two of the country's shipyards have just uh, filed for bankruptcy, kicking off a messy blame game between their Hong Kong owners and the German authorities. Let's uh, hear more now from Rob Watts uh, right there in Berlin. Uh, great to have you, Rob. So, uh, Two German shipyards have announced, you know, filing for bankruptcy, putting thousands of jobs at risk. Uh, what's happening? Well, unions here have described Tuesday as a dark day for shipbuilding in Germany. The two shipyards, MV Werften and Lloyd Werft, have declared themselves insolvent. It's after their owners, the shipbuilding subsidiary of Malaysian leisure company Genting, failed to secure further financing for a so-called mega liner called Global One, which is being built in Germany. It's designed to carry almost 10,000 passengers and is around 80% done, this mega liner, but it's thought another 600 million euros is still needed to complete it, and that is money that Genting simply does not have. Why? Well, the key reason is the devastating impact that the pandemic has had on the cruise ship industry. Travel restrictions and public concern over cruise travel have meant people are going on much fewer cruise holidays, making demand for such a mega liner not what it was when that project began. Uh, but there appears to be like, you know, a, a blame game going on, you know, over whose fault this is. Uh, what are, what are the, each side, what are they saying? So Genting had been seeking financial support from the German government to get the Global One finished and secure the future of the shipyards. However, the two sides failed to come to agreement on the terms of that financing. The German government says Genting wouldn't agree to put forward 10% of the capital as the government had requested. So Germany's economy minister Robert Habeck said the government had pulled out all the stops to prevent the insolvency of MV Werften and, and save jobs, but the owners rejected offers of help. Genting, for its part, has been trying to shift the blame onto the authorities in the German state of Mecklenburg, West Pomerania. It's taken them to court, accusing them of failing to pay out money as part of a rescue plan. Genting claims the state attached conditions to the money that weren't in the original contract. So, as you can see, the blame game is in full swing. Meanwhile, the future is very uncertain for the more than 2,000 people who work at these shipyards. All right, uh, let's look at the markets now. See, uh, European stocks uh, rebounded on Tuesday after recent losses. Uh, what are we expecting uh, from Wednesday? Well, the key thing we're getting today is investor reaction to happenings in the United States. The losses at the start of this week and at the end of last week were down to growing concerns that the Federal Reserve was going to have to increase U.S. inflation rates sooner than previously expected. This is, of course, because of high and persistent inflation in the states, well above the Fed's target. However, 
Those fears appeared to ease on Tuesday, and we've just had testimony from the Federal Reserve Chairman, Jerome Powell, before Congress, in which he appeared less hawkish than some investors had anticipated. He said the Fed does still expect to raise rates this year, but no decision has actually been made on the timing. That boosted US stocks, Asian stocks followed suit, and futures in Europe also rose. However, what markets also have to contend with today is US inflation data due out this afternoon, with traders bracing themselves for the headline figure to hit an almost four-decade high of 7% year-on-year. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Rob Watts, uh, right there in Berlin. Thank you for that uh, update. All right. Uh, moving on now, we see uh, rising costs of energy in the UK increasing the cost of uh, living with uh, British households. Let's uh, hear more now uh, from Juliana right there in the UK. Great to have you, Juliana. So I see Centrica Chief Executive uh, Chris O'Shea is uh, warning that UK's energy crisis could last for two years. The sign that, you know, the cost of living squeeze will intensify. That's uh, quite a grim picture it's painting there. It is a, a pretty grim picture ahead of a, a pretty grim day. I've got to say, uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson is currently um, giving a testimony in the House of Commons, which is a huge uh, political story in the UK at the moment. Uh, but earlier today, uh, Chris O'Shea, as you said, the Centrica boss, um, was speaking to the BBC. Centrica, uh, very, very important because, of course, it's uh, the parent company of British Gas, which is uh, Britain's largest um, energy firm. And it's really uh, been picking up mopping up all of uh, the lost customers um, over uh, several um, energy firms that have gone under over the past couple of months due to the rising costs of energy uh, prices. He was saying that, yes, he doesn't expect, unfortunately, these um, high energy bills um, to abate anytime soon. Um, but quite interestingly, he put um, a point uh, forward that we haven't really heard about uh, from energy bosses thus far, uh, which is uh, the, the clean green transition. The fact that uh, so many big firms are now moving away from coal and um, uh, um, other uh, toxic fossil fuels, gas is becoming a viable um, alternative. And that is going to be difficult for countries that are already struggling because we know there are uh, depleted services. One of the reasons why there are depleted services, um, depleted um, uh, uh, attributes is because last year it was particularly cold in Europe. It is very cold, I've got to tell you, uh, Laddie, in London at the moment. Um, so people are using more gas. Bills are expected to be higher. Um, we've got a couple of months until Ofgem, the energy regulator, rises, raises that benchmark from about £1,200 to £2,000 a month, um, a, a year, which is a lot of money. Uh, so there are concerns. And unfortunately, uh, Chris O'Shea's statement hasn't alleviated some of those fears. Yeah, I can imagine. And, you know, still talking about rising costs. See, uh, a Premier Inn's uh, owner has warned that cost, uh, cost inflation could hit about 8% coming a year. What are you hearing about that? Yeah, Whitbread have just given uh, their uh, trading update. No surprises, really. It is in line with what we're hearing uh, from airports and travel and leisure-related uh, firms, uh, that it's not been great. I believe uh, sales in the UK were down 4.4% during the festive period. Germany, which is a pretty important market for them, occupancy levels are down nearly 40%. And that's to be expected because, of course, with increasing restrictions, uh, there's nobody to stay in the hotels. And also businesses, um, which which a lot of hotels rely on business um, uh, custom because if you're having a big do, uh, lots of people occupy hotel rooms. They haven't been doing that at large scale. Lots of businesses are still uh, speaking with one another um, on virtual um, rooms. So, yes, it has been difficult for them. But I think uh, for the uh, British market, uh, something that a lot of the business news has picked up from, from their trading update is a uh, labour shortage. They are reporting that about 10% of their staff are off sick at the moment. I believe they have about a, a 30,000 strong staff. So that's 3,000 members because of Omicron. Um, there is lots of discussion in government at the moment, aside from the boozy parties, um, about reducing isolation periods from seven days to five days. And uh, bosses are saying it couldn't come any time sooner because they are uh, having a severe shortage amongst all of the other issues that they're trying to get through at the moment. You know, I guess the uh, shortage is actually continuing there. But I see uh, the FTSE is making major moves uh, today. How's the market looking? Yeah, the market's looking pretty good. Again, 
as we've been talking about all week, everybody's awaiting that inflation data uh, from America, expecting a 7%, a jump from 6.1%, which is way above the 2% benchmark. Some pretty positive news we got overnight, though, from China, showing that their inflation has actually dropped. It dropped in December um, to 1.3%, by 1.3%, which is a positive sign, because we know that, of course, China is the world's largest developer of goods. So if things are getting a little bit cheaper there, that could potentially spiral out um, in other places. So that was good. And, of course, earlier this morning, the FTSE went way above its 7,500 points target to about 7,551. Very good for the city. They haven't seen that kind of number for about two years. Led by Sainsbury's, um, one of the big four supermarkets, they've released their festive trading data showing that it was better than usual in line with what we've seen from Aldi and Lidl, the German discount retailers. So at intraday, the FTSE All Share is up at 0 06 the FTSE 100 is also up by 1.29%, and the FTSE 250, that's up by just half a percent. In currencies, the British pound is down on the US dollar by 0.06%, though up on the euro by 0.03%, and also up on the Japanese yen by 0.09% at intraday, laddie. All right, FTSE 100 looking quite good. All right, Juliana, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day. You too, thanks. All right, moving on to the U.S. Now, see, as stock futures uh, rose slightly, you know, early as investors awaited an important inflation report expected to show prices, you know, rising at the fastest pace in nearly 40 years. Uh, futures on the Dow Jones Industrial Average inched up about 15 points, about 0.06 percent. S&P 500 futures were up 0.08 percent, and the Nasdaq 100 futures uh, rose about 0.22 percent. Well, let's get a summary of uh, yesterday's close uh, from our U.S. correspondent, Maria Baird. The U.S. stock market rallied on Tuesday as the S&P 500 was up 0.9 percent, the Dow Jones rose by 0.5 percent, and the NASDAQ jumped by 1.4%. It is clear that the good news from Chairman Powell during his Senate confirmation hearing for his second term as Chairman of the Federal Reserve allowed for investors to feel comfortable, especially since he also announced that he would make sure inflation was under control in the near future. All right, now after the break, we'll look at how much startups in Africa were able to attract in 2021 and get an outlook for uh, 2022. That's in a moment. Just stay with us. Welcome back. You're watching Business Incorporated live on Channels Television. Now to the next conversation, we see you know, securing startup funding can be quite challenging, especially if you're hoping to work with a traditional lender, as banks can be you know, particular about who they give business loans to and usually want to see high sales volume, cash reserves, and at least a year of business history and, and strong credit. Many new businesses can struggle to meet these strict lending requirements. Well, startups in Africa have been receiving a lot of attention from investors across the world. Uh, let's take a look at how much funding came into Africa in 2021 and get an outlook for uh, 2022. Right now, we have uh, Raul Shah, Head Financial Equity Research at Telema uh, UK. Great to have you, Raul. Yeah, hi. Hi. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. So last time we spoke, you know, just before Christmas, you, you gave us a run through of how African stock markets, you know, performed in 2021. If we think about venture capital investment on the continent, was it a similar picture? Uh, actually, not really. Um, so 2021, as I said before, was a, a good but not great year for listed equities in, in Africa. But it was a spectacular year for um, startup companies and that were looking to raise funding. So those companies raised more than twice the amount of funds in 2021 as they did in 2020 and three times the level of 20 to 2019. So to put some numbers on that, they actually raised around $4.3 billion uh, in total. And that's across around 800 transactions across the whole of Africa. All right, Qu quite interesting. But were these investments, you know, evenly spread out across the continent or were there, you know, any hot spots? Yeah, actually, it was very concentrated. So four countries attracted around 80% of all that funding. Uh, those are Nigeria, South Africa, Kenya, and Egypt. Um, and actually, Nigeria, you know, it didn't have a great year in terms of the stock market. But uh, in terms of startup funding, it was the standard out performer on the continent. Around one third of the whole continent's funding ended up in Nigeria. And I, I think... Um, 
there's one key reason for that, and that is the financial inclusion opportunity uh, in Nigeria. So there are around 70 million individuals, you know, 70 million adults in Nigeria who um, are financially excluded in some way. Maybe they don't have a bank account or they find it difficult to secure a loan. Um, and over half of Africa's startup funding is actually going to fintech. So I think that's where the, um, the opportunity is as far as startup uh, investors are concerned. So I guess uh, fintech is getting all the action there. So, you know, 2021 was a strong year, but what about 2022? You know, would you say we've peaked or do you see more growth to come? Uh, to be honest, I think we're, we're going to see uh, more positive trends. Um, I think there's a few reasons for that. So if we, if we think about Nigeria, yes, it was a start reformer, but the, the total amount of funding was equivalent to only around $7 per person. Um, that compares to $19 in India or $1,000 in, in the United States. So, um, and, and remember, you know, Nigeria was one of the better performers. So for most of Africa, you're looking at funding levels of around a dollar per person. So there's definitely a lot of upside. Uh, the other reason why I, I, I think it's um, going to be a better year is that we're seeing more um, billion dollar startup companies being formed in Africa. Uh, so these are popularly known as unicorns. And, and five companies joined the billionaire club uh, in Africa last year. And actually some of your um, viewers probably use some of these companies already, uh, you know, the likes of Opay or Flutterwave, uh, Andela and Chipper Cash. Um, and, and, you know, I expect that we will see more uh, such unicorns uh, appearing in 2022. Do you see some of these companies actually, you know, getting publicly uh, traded? Uh, some of them are, are going public, yeah. I mean, so, um, uh, you know, a, a key example is, is e-finance in Egypt, for example, which IPO'd just before the end of last year. And, and that's a payments company, so, you know, in the fintech sphere. All right. But uh, look, so now, any thoughts on which markets could do well, you know, this year? I mean, we can look into your, your crystal ball. <laughs> um, well, I think, um, you know, we talked about fintech, and I think fintech is going to continue to attract the bulk of the attention. Uh, and, and when you think about fintech, you, you know, you're looking at the financial inclusion opportunity. So the countries that are, uh, you know, are most interesting from that perspective are the ones with big population centers and poor financial infrastructure. So you know, Nigeria, Egypt, uh, Ethiopia, uh, even Democratic Republic of Congo. I think these are the markets where fintechs can make a real difference, and, and that's what investors are, you know, are latching onto. All right, Raul Shah, always great to talk to you. Head Financial Activity Research at uh, Talama UK. Uh, thanks so much for coming on the program today. Thank you so much. All right, uh, moving on now, we see uh, Libya set to restart oil export from two key Western ports uh, after militias and the blockade of pipelines, but shipments and production in the east continues to be hit by uh, bad weather. State-controlled national oil coal uh, lifted uh, the force majeure at the ports of Zawiya and uh, Melita, terminals and the fields serving them, including uh, Sharara, uh, Libya's biggest shot for about uh, three weeks after a paramilitary uh, force uh, known as the Petroleum Facil Facilities Guard closed pipelines in a dispute over the pay. Libya's overall production, you know, briefly rebounded to 1 million barrels a day this week when uh, Sharar restarted, but is below 900,000 barrels a day, again, because of the weather disruptions in the east. That's led to the closure this week of at least four ports, according to uh, those familiar with the matter there. Uh, prior to the uh, closures, Libya's oil sector was experiencing a period of calm you know, production rose above 1 million barrels a day in late 2020 and averaged around uh, 1.2 million in 2021. And Kenya Port Authority acquired a $16.65 million multipurpose salvage tugboat and three ship-to-shore uh, gantry cranes at $28.9 million as Kenya becomes the second African country uh, in Africa after South Africa to own salvage boats. The salvage tugboats uh, bought from Turkey and three shipped to shore uh, gantry cranes uh, from Japan will boost efficiency and bulk handling activities at a second container terminal. This follows uh, President Uhuru Kenyatta's order for the port efficiency to boost uh, businesses in East Africa. The multipurpose tugboat uh, will provide rescue services, marine salvage, fire suppression at sea, and 
uh, control maritime uh, pollution. Uh, KPA has already received business requests for the use of the tugboat for uh, rescue marine operations during emergencies. And the African Import and Export Bank and the state-run National Bank of Egypt have signed a memorandum of understanding to promote trade and investment flows into Egypt. Under the MOU signed, uh, the, uh, the uh, Intra-Africa intra Trade Fair, uh, the two institutions agreed to broaden and deepen their collaboration in the provision of products and services related to project uh, preparation, project uh, finance, and asset-based finance. Intra-Africa Trade export development finance, among others. The MOU establishes a joint project uh, preparation facility between the two institutions, a first of a kind for an Egyptian uh, commercial bank. The partnership aims to catalyze the, and advance the attainment of uh, Egypt's strategic objectives as spouse under the Sustainable Development Strategy, uh, Egypt Vision 2030. This would be by creating quality jobs, enhancing competitiveness of the country's economy, embedding economic resilience and facilitating uh, market access within the Africa continental free trade area. And uh, still uh, North Africa, that Egypt's export has hit an all-time high in 2021 at $31 billion, a figure uh, which exceeds the pre-pandemic level. The country's exports recorded about $30 billion in 2019 despite the COVID-19 pandemic and its uh, impact on all sectors of the economy. Uh, Egypt's total exports contracted in 2020 by about 12.4% 12 uh, compared to 2019, you know, posting $26 billion in terms of value, according to uh, data uh, from the uh, trend, trend economy. As a result of the pandemic, chemical industry products topped Egypt's exports in 2021, growing by 40% compared to 2019 to surpass $6 billion. Uh, construction materials, foodstuffs, engineering items, agricultural products, uh, ready-made garments, paper and packaging, and upholstery and, and medical products were top sectors that achieved significant growth in exports in 2021. In September 2020, the government uh, launched an initiative targeting instant cash repayments of exporters' uh, arrears with the aim of providing the liquidity needed uh, for companies to fulfill their obligations towards their clients and keep on uh, their employees' And the value of Zimbabwe's exports rose by 20.93% uh, to $647 million in November last year, which, you know, helped the country to significantly uh, cut its trade deficit for the month. Although imports increased marginally, Zimbabwe registered the remarkable decline in the trade deficit, which means a significant amount of hot currency was uh, retained in the economy. According to the Zimbabwe National Statistical Agency, uh, the same, during the same period, imports increased by 4.07% uh, to $683 million from uh, $712 million in October 2021. And that's it on Business Incorporated. Thank you for watching. I'm Laddie Williams. Bye for now.